Last Sunday evening, we began a series of sermons on the first letter of John, to which we have given the title, True Christian Assurance. It's very obvious when you begin to study the writings of John in the New Testament, of which there are five, that the gospel and the first epistle have a clear link with each other. The gospel tells us clearly towards the end that these things are written by John in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. They are, in other words, written in order to elicit faith in those who read. The first epistle, on the other hand, towards the end of that part of the New Testament also, has a clear statement of its purpose. It is written to those who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, the gospel is designed to elicit faith, and the first letter is designed to produce in us assurance. We found last Sunday evening that there are two ways, in general, in which people's Christian assurance may be attacked. One of them is by an attack on the objective facts of the gospel, that is, an attempt to discredit the truth of the gospel and say that it is not worthy of our trust. The second area of attack is at the subjective level of our own personal experience of Christ, where one of the things the devil very frequently does is to try to dislodge our assurance that we ourselves are true believers. Now, John is ministering to both of these concerns, and uh, we discovered last time that his concern to produce Christian assurance in the believers to whom he is writing is not a superficial thing, nor is he content with a mere assurance that will refer to the surface of people's lives. It is not an easy believism that he is concerned with. He wants their assurance to be both well grounded on the historic truth of the Christian gospel, of which he speaks in these early verses, and evidenced in the life of the Christian believer. In other words, how do I know that I have faith is one of the real issues John raises. And he relates our assurance to three different spheres of life, to our social relationships with others, where he finds that love for the brethren is the evidence of our being in Christ. He relates it also to doctrinal matters and tells us that when we believe aright, that is, when our thinking is true, that's an evidence that we are in Christ. And above all, when we relate to God in obedience, that is an evidence which we may put towards our assurance that we are truly Christ's. Now, John has opened up this to us in the first four verses of the letter. And then in verse 5, having described this message as being eternal, verse 1, from the beginning, historical, that is, we have heard it, seen it, looked at it, touched it. He finally tells us it is personal, the life appeared to us, and we have fellowship with the Father and with Jesus Christ, His Son. He then goes on from verse 5 to tell us precisely what the message of this gospel is. And from verse 5, to which we turn now, and it will help you to have your Bible, 
open before you, John is concerned to reveal to us the very essence of the message of the Christian gospel which God has given to them. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. Now, clearly you will notice he is speaking not about a message that is the outcome of their own wisdom or imagination, but a message we have heard from him. That is probably from the risen Christ. And declare to you. And so he is an ambassador to declare the message that he has received from Christ and has to pass on to those to whom God has committed him to send it. And that message is then described halfway through verse 5. And I want to draw your attention to two things. First is the way the gospel is defined. Notice how unusual in many ways and surprising to our expectation in many senses his description or de de definition of the gospel is. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, it's a highly significant thing that John is saying to us the Christian gospel is not first and foremost a message about man. It is a message about God. It does not focus on the plight and problems of mankind. It focuses on who God is and what he is in his majestic glory. Now this is something we need to pause at for a moment or two because there is no question that in our modern thinking about the Christian gospel, our tendency is to make it man-centered rather than God-centered. And the biblical gospel, equally without doubt, is God-centered rather than man-centered. Let me give you an illustration of it. The sort of thing that we are inclined to do is to commend the gospel to people by saying to them, how do you find yourself? Do you find yourself miserably unhappy? Do you find yourself defeated by habits you can't control? Do you find yourself isolated and alone in the world? Do you find this need or that need or the other need in your heart this evening? And then the next stage of our exposition of the gospel is Jesus Christ will meet that need. He will come and lift that burden. He will deal with that problem. Now, I want you to think carefully about this because do you see what that is doing? It is putting man, by which I mean the generic man, man and woman, at the center of the whole picture. Whereas what the Bible does is to put God at the center of the picture. And John says, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light. Now the danger of our putting mankind at the center of the Christian gospel is precisely this, that it tends to make God man's servant to meet his needs, rather than man, God's servant, to glorify his name. And if the Christian gospel is seeking to set right one thing above everything else, it is this, that the problem of humanity, 
is that instead of having God at the center of our life, we have self at the center of our life. And so often the Christian gospel can be relevant and useful and attractive to us simply because it deals with what is already central to us. And you see what that does. If that is how we have been attracted to the Christian gospel with a self-centered, man-centered emphasis, upon the nature of the gospel, that so often produces a self-centered way of Christian living, where the thing that interests us is that we expect God to be in the great business of keeping me happy, supplying all my needs, doing everything that I want Him to do, keeping me content. Now you will notice how different that is from the great statement that many of us here learned in the shorter catechism of the Westminster Confession, which tells us what man's function in the world is in these words. Man's chief end, it says, is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And the gospel of Jesus Christ has as its aim and outcome to restore us to that position where God will be at the center of our life where His glory will be everything that we are aiming for in this world. And then, my dear friends, we will find that we ourselves become everything that in our wildest dreams we could scarcely have imagined. Because when God is in His rightful place, then everything else fits into its rightful place too. Now this is enormously important. And I think we need to learn it in a special way in these days. How the gospel is defined then is this, that it confronts us with a God who is our creator and who one day will be our judge. And the most important thing in the whole wide world is how I relate to Him. Do you really believe that this evening? Because I tell you one of the devil's greatest pieces of cunning is to convince us that there is something more important than that, how I relate to God, where I am, with Him. That is the vital thing about life. Every day I live. And here's the second thing that's clear in that same verse. The Apostle says, this is the message. We have heard from Him and declare to you that God is light. It is the way in which God is described. Now you know there are several ways in which God is described in the Bible. He is love. God is love. He is fire. Our God is like a consuming fire. But here, He is light. Now, when the message of the Christian gospel came to these people through the lips of the apostle John and his companions... What happened was that they were confronted with a God who was infinitely holy and infinitely true. Because these are the two things that light refers to in Scripture, you will know. Light has both a moral and an intellectual implication. When we say that God is light, 
we are saying that God is burning, consuming holiness and purity and righteousness. So the Scripture speaks in the passage we often read at Christmas time about those who walk in darkness. What does it mean? Unholiness, sinfulness, evil is the whole world of darkness. But God not only dwells in light, God is light. And Jesus describes himself in these terms. I am the light of the world. And light has this moral implication that those who walk in the darkness are walking in ethical disobedience to God. Those who walk in the light are walking in obedience to God and in open fellowship with Him. They have nothing to hide, you see. And so when John says to us, here is the description of God, He is light. When they meet with that God, they suddenly discover it is like being under the kind of intensity of a floodlight focused into some narrow beam that almost bores a hole through you. They cannot stand this light because the very nature and character of God is that He is absolute holiness. But it not only has an ethical and moral implication, it also has an intellectual reference. Because God is not only infinitely holy, He is absolute truth. And whereas light is a symbol of truth, Darkness is a symbol of error. And God is light. So he is absolute truth and without implications of error. Now it's a very significant thing that part of what John is saying here is that the gospel begins with God being defined and described as light. But that light also has an implication of revelation. What light does is to reveal, doesn't it? I don't know if you've ever been here when we've had power cuts, but in the middle of the winter, we have several times been plunged into total darkness. And I have often thought that I could have gone on preaching, and then when the lights came back on again, there would have been a great revelation. Everybody had gone home <laughs> while the lights were off. Because it's the light that reveals the truth, you see. And the light shines in the darkness, John tells us in his first chapter of his gospel. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness could not extinguish it. But the light reveals by its shining, and as the light shines, so it is the nature of God to reveal himself. And when he does reveal himself to us in the gospel, what we discover is this burning holiness and this absolute truthfulness which burns up every lie and exposes every sin. Now can you see why John now goes on to say to us, how do you have a relationship then with this God? How can you possibly relate to a God like this? Because we are aware of the darkness that is in us, the deceitfulness of our sin, the lies in our character, and the disobedience to God in our nature. How do we have fellowship with such a God? Well, that's the very next thing that John goes on to speak to us about. 
Do you notice how he does it from verse 6 onwards to the end of the chapter? What he is really doing there is leading us to understand how fatal it is to have a wrong view of sin in relation to this God. Notice it from verse 6. These three wrong views are all introduced with the three words, if we claim. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie, do not live by the truth. Verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Now I want us just in a few moments to look at these three wrong views of having fellowship with God in relation to our own sinfulness. And this has a great deal to do, as you will realize, with the whole question of Christian assurance. The first false attitude to sin in verse 6 is really the attitude of carelessness about it. Carelessness about it. Notice what verse 6 says. What it basically says, let me tell you first of all, and then you'll see it here. What it really says is that in terms of my fellowship with God, in terms of my having a relationship with God, sin is insignificant. Sin does not matter. Verse 6, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness. Now, walking in darkness has this moral emphasis of sinning. The people who walked in darkness saw a great light with it. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live according to the truth. Now, that is the attitude that John is exposing and is clearly saying is fatally flawed because the result of it is we lie and do not live by the truth. Now, it's a really important thing for us, I think, to take this on board in the society in which we live today. There are so many pressures and influences from modern society upon all our lives. We live in a world which is careless about sin, to the point where it regards it as something of a joke. We live in a society where the idea of taking sin seriously as a barrier to our relationship with God would be something that belonged to another era altogether. And let me point out to you what John tells us about this. He says, we are not living by the truth. We are liars either to ourselves or to God or to other people if we imagine that sin in my life has no effect on my fellowship with God. Now just let me pause for a moment. Do you really believe that's true? It would be a natural and normal thing if there were some of us in church this evening who really believed that sin in my life and character makes no difference to my fellowship with God. And John says, my dear brothers and sisters, that's a lie. That's a downright, total lie. Because it does affect your fellowship with God. You cannot have fellowship with Him and live a life of carelessness in relation to sin. What fellowship has light with darkness asks the Apostle. And the answer is, none. None. And this is an area 
where it's of immense importance for us to face the truth. What does he mean by living in darkness? He means living a life that ignores God and has sought to hide from him. Now, in verse 7, you notice John turns from the negative to the positive, from the error to the correction, from the sickness to the cure. And in verse 7, the cure is this. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Now, if you had been following his argument carefully, what you would really have expected John to say is, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with God. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie. So if we do walk in the light, the answer should be, we have fellowship with God. But that's not what he says. He says we have fellowship with one another. Now what's the point? The point's this. If you are living in darkness, it will not only affect your fellowship with God it will affect your fellowship with other believers as well. And so John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We are not trying to hide from one another in the darkness. We are out into the light. We want to walk in the light so that there is nothing between us and God and there will be nothing between us and our brother or sister in Christ. And how does that happen? How is it that there is nothing between us and God? Well, says John, the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. And there we're at the nub of it. That is what the gospel of Jesus Christ does for the man or woman who is in the presence of a holy God who discovers that the one thing that will separate me from God is sin. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, purifies me from all sin. Now, there is the ground of genuine Christian assurance. We don't get assurance by saying, oh, sin doesn't really matter. I can forget all about it. People nowadays in these enlightened ages in which we live, they don't bother about sin. John says, well, God bothers enough about it to send his only begotten son to die on Calvary in order that by his shed blood he may cleanse you from it all. How may I therefore appear before a holy God who is light? I may do so by being cleansed in the blood of his only begotten Son who died in my place that he might take my sin. Here's the second thing that is the second wrong attitude he gives to us. In verse 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, I think that if the first attitude is one of carelessness about sin and of dismissing its seriousness, the second is a form of escapism from the responsibility for our sin. If we claim to be without sin, the implication seems to be without the responsibility for it. Do you know how nowadays people have this great concern to escape the responsibility for their sin? It is not my fault, it's my fate. It's not my action, it's my genes or something of the kind. And what God is saying to us through the Apostle is if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, nobody else, just ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
Now, how then are we cured from this refusal to face the responsibility of our sin? Verse 9 is the answer. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? He says we are to confess our sins. Now, the mistake that many people make in relation to confession of sin is that they think that to confess sin is the same thing as to admit it. You know, that's what you do when you confess something at the human level, isn't it? You admit that you've done it. You may have known the experience in school, as many of us have done when the teacher said, you were suspected of being guilty of doing something wrong, confess it, he would say. We used to have a teacher in Alan Glenn's school where I was um, uh, resident for some time. He used to point to us, and you would hear his voice if you were in another class along the corridor, confess, boy, he would say. You can just imagine the horror that was going on in that classroom. Schools have changed so much since these days. But what he really meant was, admit it. But that's not what biblical confession is. Let me tell you what it is. The word to confess sin in the Bible is exactly the word to say the same things as. It is the word homologio, to say the same thing. And it is to say the same thing as God about my sin. That's what confessing sin is. When David in Psalm 51 confesses his sin, he is saying, you are justified when you judge the sin. He describes the sin before God as God has described it. He says the same things as God about his sin. And you and I have to see this as confession. We have far from hiding it, far from giving excuses for it, we have to say the same things as God says about our sin. And then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So first the blood of Jesus Christ washes away the defilement of our sin. Then the mercy of God lifts the guilt of our sin and purges us from unrighteousness. And finally, in verse 10, there is the third false attitude, which is this. If we claim... Notice these three things. If we claim to a fellowship with him, but walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. Now, what John means when he says, if we claim we have not sinned, is most probably to suggest that sin has never appeared in our life or character or behavior. And John says, if we claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Notice the significance of this. He does not say now, you are a liar and deceived. He says, you are making God out to be a liar. And his word has no place in our lives because it is God's word that exposes our sins. 
how can you have been living close to the Word of God day by day and not recognizing the depth of your sinfulness? But notice in the first two verses of chapter 2 that it is that very Word that God uses not only to expose our sin, but to deliver us from it. My dear children, I write this to you. Now, John is speaking about his own letter, but it's true of all Scripture. I write this to you so that you will not sin. Now, clearly, God's great purpose for his children is to deliver them from sin. One day he is going to deliver them from his very presence in glory. But his purpose is to keep us from sinning in this world. How does he do it? He does it first by his word. Do you notice that? By the written word. These things I have written to you so that you will not sin. And it is the living Word of God in Holy Scripture that prevents us from sinning. D.L. Moody used to hold up his Bible to young converts and say to them, either this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. I have found over all the years I've been a Christian that that's absolutely and utterly true. Haven't you? Yeah, I see some nodding. So God has given us a means by which we will be kept from sinning. That does not mean that we will never ever sin. But it does mean that the Word of God is a protective against sin in our lives. Listen to the psalmist. Your Word, your Word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's what the Word of God is for. And that's what it does. But there is another provision, not only in the written word, and with this we finish, but in the incarnate word crucified in our place. My dear children, chapter 2, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, he recognizes the fact that to the end of our days in this world, we are going to be troubled by sin. If anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. That is, the Lord Jesus Christ ascended at the right hand of God the Father is our advocate to speak on our behalf. But He is more than that. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. The Lord Jesus Christ at the Father's right hand is the one who by his atoning sacrifice has dealt with our sin. And what he is speaking about is really what we began with. The burning holiness of God as in wrath he turns against sin. How can that ever be turned aside? I tell you. By the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ dying in our place. Now, how can you have Christian assurance then? Well, I tell you, it's very simple. There is one thing that you may rest your confidence in, and that is the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and at the Father's right hand for every need you will ever have in this world because He is a sufficient Savior for everyone of His people.
I may, says John Newton, I may my fierce accuser face and tell him. Now, what do you tell the fierce accuser? Oh, well, I'm not quite so bad as you might imagine. I have a lot of positive points to put up against all these negative accusations. No, says Newton. I may my fierce accuser face and tell him, Thou hast died. That's enough, my friends. He cannot stand that. And he will flee. And you will rest in the sufficiency of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the glory of your grace in Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would write your word in our hearts. We ask it in his blessed name. Amen.